The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an equitable education fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Great Deception. That there is an unprecedented crime wave engulfing the nation at the present time is an indisputable fact. The reasons for that crime wave are many and varied, and the ripples of that wave touch your daily life wherever you live or wherever you work. Some years ago, when we were fighting a war for our survival, we seemed to understand that if there existed anywhere in the world any brand of tyranny, if in one isolated spot the freedom of human beings was threatened, then ours, too, was likewise threatened. That was an accepted fact, because the truth of it was proven. It is an equally solid fact that any crime anywhere in the world affects you. It affects not only your daily life, but it also affects the nation. For it is written in stone on the facade of the building which houses the Federal Bureau of Investigation in Washington, D.C., that no free government can survive that is not based on the supremacy of the law. And if the day should ever come when crimes can be committed with impunity, then the freedom of the nation, your freedom, will be gone forever. Tonight's file opens in the living room of a nicely furnished home located in the suburb of a large eastern city. It is mid-afternoon. One of the occupants of this dwelling, Mrs. Peter Clayton, is arranging flowers in a vase as the front door opens. Elizabeth! Peter! Hello, my oh, dear. Oh, Peter, darling. Oh, darling. Oh, my, it's so good to see you. I'm so happy to have you home. I looked for you at the airport. Oh, I was furious about that. I didn't get your wire until ten minutes ago. Well, I sent it when we landed at Newfoundland. Newfoundland? Well, I certainly should have gotten it. You know, I have a good mind to call those people. Oh, forget it, darling. Oh. Don't you want to hear about the trip? Oh, of course. How is Paris? Well, I'm too tired to go into all of the details now, but I'm afraid the trip was a failure. Well, what do you mean? What happened? It's a long story. Come on upstairs. I'll tell you about it. All right, dear. Well, at least the trip was successful in one way. You did put on some weights. What makes you say that? Oh, that suit you're wearing. It's tight on you. I bought this suit in New York at one o'clock. Today? Uh-huh. But why? Why did you need another suit? Well, I couldn't very well come out here in an army uniform. Oh, Peter, what are you talking about? What were you doing with an army uniform? I wore it to get out of France. But where did you get it? Off the body of a soldier I killed. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Bob Hudson. You very busy, Bob? No, Jim. I just got to read this report on the Lester case. Why, what's up? Oh, I was in to see the SAC. He wants us to work together on something that's just come in. Hmm, fine. What kind of a case is it? Oh, we're not sure. 
I'd better give you this thing the way the SAC gave it to me, huh? Okay, Jim, shoot. An unidentified man was found dead in a garage in Paris. Paris, France? That's right. From his clothes, the Paris police were able to guess that he was an American. All of the clothes were from stores in this country. I see. The Paris newspapers ran a picture of this unidentified dead American in the hope that somebody might be able to let them know who he was. Uh Well, the day the picture appeared in the papers, a major in the United States Army recognized the person, identified him as a deserter. Well, how do we get in on this, Jim? Oh, I'll come to that, Bob. The Army airmailed the fingerprints of the dead man to Signal Corps headquarters in Washington. They sent the prints over to IDENT to confirm the major's identification. Well, now, let me see if I understand all the facts so far. Okay. A man is found dead in a Paris garage, mm. and we have identified the prints as belonging to an Army deserter. That's right. Now, what's the rest of the story? Well, the Paris police, in checking every possible lead, came across something that puzzled them. The dead American's name was George A. Perry. His, uh... Army serial number was uh, uh, 12060514. And the Paris police found that a sergeant, George A. Perry, with that same serial number, returned to this country on an army plane from Paris yesterday. Well, well, how could that happen? Well, that's what had them puzzled. They checked the army orders, which were on file at the airport in Paris. They found out they were counterfeit. Have we got a copy of those orders? Not yet, but we're getting a copy of them. Also, the uh, civilian clothes that were found on the dead soldier. Well, what do you make of this whole thing, Jim? Well, Bob, I think it's probable that whoever murdered Perry switched clothes with him, forged those orders, and then came home in Perry's uniform. Mm, That makes sense. Uh, Technically, we're looking for this man, not for murder, but on a charge of illegal wearing of the uniform. That's right, Bob. Have we got any idea what this man we're looking for looks like? No, none yet. Well, what do you think we ought to do first, then, Jim? I've already called the airport here. I've got a list of the people who returned on that plane from Paris from them. How about addresses? They were all Army personnel, so locating them shouldn't be too difficult. At least a couple of them should remember what he looked like. Uh-huh. Then we'll send the description down to Washington, let them check the general appearance file, and send us as many pictures as they have. Oh, that'll work if the killer's a known desperate criminal. That's right. Jim, when do you want to start checking the passengers on that plane? Right now, Bob. Here, let's split this list in half and start making some phone calls. <laughs> coffee, Peter? No, thank you, dear. You're not eating much breakfast. Well, it's so long since I've seen an American paper, I'd much rather read. Peter? Yes, dear? Can I consult you on a few engagements? <laughs> All right, dear. The Shelleys want us Thursday night for cocktails. Now, what'll I tell them? Tell them we'll be there. Oh, good. Now, the Flippins want us for dinner on Saturday. Well, I'm not too sure about that. I may be tied up Saturday. On the Paris business? No, darling. That book is closed. Oh, I hope that's true. What do you mean? I hope you're in the clear. Elizabeth, I've told you a dozen times, no one can possibly connect me with the killing. But you were that sergeant's partner, weren't you? Well, a very silent partner. But, Peter, when they investigate his death, they're bound to find out about his black market operation. Well, it still won't lead to me. Yes, but, Peter, you Look, I will have some more coffee now, dear. And as for dinner at the Flippins, tell them we accept. Jim. Yes, Bob? We just received a report from the Paris police. Oh, what is it? Well, they conducted a further investigation on that army deserter's activities. Oh, what'd they find? Well, he was a pretty active figure in the black market. Oh. He was also believed to have a partner, a man who had come from America to superintend his operations. Sort of an efficiency expert? That's it. Paris police have any idea who that man might be? No. Uh, how have you been making out with the plane passengers? Well, I showed them all the pictures Washington sent to us out of the general appearance file. Any luck? Yes, three of the passengers all picked this picture here. Hmm. Yeah, they say this is the man who came back on the plane with them. Who is he? His name is Peter Caldwell. Well, we got a record on him? Yeah, but I don't know how much good it'll do us. Well, why not? Well, for one thing, Caldwell's arrest record doesn't show anything since 1939. In addition to that, we're not even sure what his name is. What do you mean, Jim? Well, he's been arrested under the names Calhoun, Carroll, Carlson, Crawford, Clinton, and Crenshaw. Oh, I see. So I think it's pretty obvious that he's using some name now other than Peter Caldwell. Mm-hmm. However, we can assume that he's here in town. Why? Well, here is clothes. They were all bought here. Are those the clothes he put on the dead soldier? Yeah, they just arrived from Paris. Any identification? No, none on the suit, but... Here, Bob, take a look at these shoes. Oh. They're custom made. Now, take a look at these marks inside the tongue here on the left shoe. 
They don't mean anything to me, Jim. Well, custom shoemakers, Bob, have their own method of marking shoes. So I think we'd better take these to one of the custom shoemakers here in town. Where do you want to start? Well, there's a bootmaker right down on the next block. I'm going over and see him. If he can tell us who made these shoes, we might find the murderer. I didn't expect you'd still be home. I thought you were going to the office. I changed my mind. I phoned instead. Is something wrong? Yeah. What is it? I was informed I had a caller at my office. He was from the FBI. Oh. Talked to my secretary, asked questions. About Paris? Yes. Then they must suspect. That's right. And you were so sure they didn't know? Yes. What are you going to do, Peter? I'm just trying to think that out. It's a little difficult... Somehow you never realize a thing like this can happen to you. Have you spoken to your lawyer? Well, hardly. Well, why not? He would certainly Elizabeth, be... my lawyer knows me as a legitimate businessman. I don't think he'd be much help on a murder charge. Well, then who can you turn to? No one. Oh, but darling, that means everything we've built up for nine years. Our friends, our home, our respectability. They're all gone. That's right, dear. Oh, dear. I'm afraid there's only one solution. Peter, what do you mean? You know what I mean. There's only one way out. And I'm going to take it. Turn in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Very soon now, millions of eager young Americans will answer the summons of the college bells, ringing in a new academic year, years that most men consider the happiest of their lives. But college years are not only happy years, they're profitable ones too. It's a fact that higher education means higher income. Actually, the average college graduate earned $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. Think that over, Bob. Well, naturally, I want my boy to get a college education, Mr. Keating. But it seems kind of early to start worrying about it now. He's just halfway through grammar school. That's where you're wrong, Bob. The sooner you begin planning your boy's college education, the better chance he'll have of getting it. So, the sooner you get the facts about an equitable education fund, the better. Well, what sort of fund is that, Mr. Keating? It's a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education... The money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the Education Fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, say, Mr. Keating, whom do I see about starting one of these plans? An Equitable Society representative, I suppose. Right, Bob. Get in touch with an equitable man soon. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Above all, don't delay. Start an equitable education fund right away to make sure that when the college bells ring out, your boy or girl will be able to answer the call. And now back to the FBI file, The Great Deception. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI again illustrates the important fact that there is no geography in crime. A criminal operates when and where he finds the proper accumulation of evil. That may be on the other side of the world, or it may be across the street from where you listen to this program. That is one of the reasons why the Federal Bureau of Investigation cooperates in bringing you this series of programs. 
so that you, the law-abiding citizen, may know that crime can come anywhere at any time. Your FBI does not want you to be constantly suspicious of everyone or anything, but it does want you to be alert. In the words of director J. Edgar Hoover, wherever law and order break down, there you will find public indifference. And wherever law and order break down, there you will also find the FBI. But public indifference can do more to aid the criminal than your FBI can do to harm him. For that reason, it is important to you individually and to the nation as a whole that all of you bend your every effort in aiding the forces of law and order to conquer the current crime wave. Without you, that crime wave cannot be conquered. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Bob, we're making progress. I've covered a lot of ground since this morning. I see you've still got Caldwell shoes. Yeah, I went over to the bootmakers on the next block after I left here. He recognized the shoes. You mean he made them? No, but he said they looked to him like shoes that were turned out by a custom shoemaker named Hampton. Uh-huh. So I went over to Hampton's shop. I found out this pair of shoes was made for one of their customers. Hmm, did they tell you his name? It's a Peter Clayton. He's a regular customer. Then they had his address. No, the records show that he'd always picked up his shoes. He's never had them delivered. Then we're stymied again. Not this time, Bob. I played a hunch. I had the office check passports for me. They found that a Peter Clayton had been issued a passport with a visa for France. That was a good hunch, Jim. The French embassy showed me Clayton's request. His stationery had a Broadway address on it. It was Clayton's office, so I went there. Did you see him? No, he wasn't in, but I spoke to his secretary and got his home address. Where does he live? At North Centerville. I called the office here for help, and the place is now under surveillance. Well, that's about an hour's ride out in the island, isn't it? Yeah, it is by train, but we can make it a little quicker than that in a car. I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Mr. Taylor, this is Sergeant Fulton out in North Centerville. Oh, yes, Sergeant. I have a report for you. Fine, let's have it. One of our patrolmen called to report a minute ago. Part of his detail is the 12th Street Bridge. Yes. He reported that someone jumped off the bridge and committed suicide. It was Peter Clayton. Right over here, Mr. Taylor. This is where the man jumped. How do you know that, officer? Well, this is where I found his clothes in the suicide note. No, I see. You, uh, you didn't see him go off the bridge, did you? No, I didn't. Did you, uh, just stumble onto his effects? Oh, no, I was told to come here by headquarters. Oh? They received a phone call from a man who said he happened to be passing by and saw someone jump in the river. Tell me, do you know where this man called from? Yeah, a place at the end of the bridge. Joe's Diner. It's open all night. I see what did you do with Clayton's effects? I brought them to his wife, and she said the clothes belonged to him. Mm-hmm. What was her reaction? She read the note and collapsed. I see. Officer, how far is uh, Clayton's house from here? Oh, just a few blocks down the road. Thanks. I think I'll get over and interview the widow. Just a minute. Mrs. Clayton? Yes. Are you from the police? I'm a special agent of the FBI, Mrs. Clayton. Oh. Here are my credentials. Please come in. Thank you. I'm awfully sorry to have to bother you at a time like this. Have they found anything yet? No, ma'am. Mrs. Clayton, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor. Yes, surely. What is it you want? Do you still have the note that the police brought you? The note Peter wrote? Yes, ma'am. It's there, on the table. May I have it, please? Will you return it? Yes, yes, surely. Mr. Taylor? Yes? The things the police told me about my husband, are they true? I'm afraid so, yes. Uh, I just can't conceive it. As far as I knew, well, he was just in a regular business. I understand. Well, I think I'll be going now. Thank you, Mrs. Clayton, for your courtesy. Hello? 
Hello, Peter. Elizabeth, where are you calling from? I'm in a phone booth in the drugstore. Ah, how's it working? Better than you even thought it would. Fine. The man from the FBI was at the house. Oh, what did he want? He wanted to get the suicide note you left on the bridge. Did he give any special reason? No. Uh-huh. Did you let him have it? Yes. Did he sound convinced about my death? Completely. You're in the clear. Only temporarily, I'm afraid. Now, what do you mean? Well, when my body isn't found, they'll get suspicious. But inasmuch as this was just a delaying action, we'll now have plenty of time to really disappear. How long do you want me to stay here? How soon can you get away? Any time. Hire a car and chauffeur and drive right up. You have the directions. Yes. Is the hotel crowded? You don't think I'd come here if it was. This is a winter resort. It's out of season. In fact, it's a perfect spot for a man who has just committed suicide. <laughs> Jim, hmm? have you finished your report on the Clayton case yet? No, Bob. I've been busy most of the day. You been assigned to a new case yet? No, not yet. Jim, will you go along with me on something? What is it? Will you hold back the Clayton report for a little while? <laughs> You're a little suspicious of that one, too. Yes. I went over Clayton's record last night. He just doesn't seem to be the kind of a man who commits suicide. Well, that's the same conclusion I've come to. Well, then I guess I won't look too foolish when I tell you that I spent most of the day at the morgue. There's been no trace of Clayton's body. Makes our theory look even better. Uh-huh. I spent most of my time today at the lab. I had the handwriting experts check the suicide note and the signature on those forged army orders. It's their opinion they were both written by the same man. With that evidence, they could convict Clayton on a murder charge. Yes, if he's alive. Uh, well, excuse me. Pardon. Special Agent Hudson. This is Sergeant Fulton up in North Centerville. Is Mr. Taylor in? Just a moment. It's Sergeant Fulton for you, Jim. Oh, yeah. I had the suicide note delivered to him so he could return it to Mrs. Clayton. Thanks, Bob. Hello, Sergeant. I went out to return that suicide note, Mr. Taylor, as soon as your messenger gave it to me. Mrs. Clayton is still hysterical? I don't know. She was gone. What? A neighbor said she left an hour ago with luggage. I don't like that. Sergeant, uh, wait for us at her house. We'll be right out. Bob, Mrs. Clayton left her home this morning, complete with luggage. Uh -oh. Come on, we better drive out there and find out where she went. Bob, I've just finished talking to the neighbor who told the sergeant she saw Mrs. Clayton leave. According to her, Mrs. Clayton was picked up by a car and chauffeur. Well, it wasn't her own car. I checked. Theirs are still in the garage. Oh, it's a friend's car. I don't think it is, Bob. Not with a chauffeur. I have a hunch it was rented. Oh, but there's no place in North Centerville where you can rent a car and a chauffeur. No, but there are plenty of those places in town. Let's get back to the office and start checking. I found the place, Bob. It's the Ajax Auto Rental Service. Did they know where she was going? No, but they did say she rented a car for 12 hours, starting at 10.30 this morning. Well, it could be that her trip would take six hours each way. Yeah. That means the chauffeur won't be back until 10.30 tonight. It also means we've got seven and a half hours to sit here and wait. Jim, we've got to assume now that she's on her way to meet her husband. Now, the only thing we can do until we hear from that chauffeur is send out another alarm over the wire on Clayton. No, sir. No, sir, we can do more than that. You just reminded me of something. Well, what's that? We've still got Clayton's picture, haven't we? Well, surely. Why? I've got an idea. Let's get that picture and take a little ride. More coffee, Peter? No, thank you, dear. You're not eating much breakfast. <laughs> I've missed that these past few days. What? You're saying I'm not eating much breakfast. Well, it's true. You always read your paper. Well, you always keep talking. <laughs> All that's missing now is our engagements for the week. Oh, heavens. What? I just remembered. I never canceled our dinner engagement with the Flippins. Darling, inasmuch as I'm presumably at the bottom of the river, I think they'll understand. Peter. Yes, dear. When are we leaving this hotel? You just arrived. Is it safe for us to stay here? Mm, temporarily, yes. After all, I changed my name, my appearance. That's true. Peter, I still think I should write to them. Who? The Flippins. After all, I'm not at the bottom of the river. <laughs> Who's that? Oh, probably valet service. I called them. Will you let them in, dear? I'll get my dress. Okay. Yes? 
Hello, Mr. Clayton. I'm uh, afraid you have the wrong room. My name is Cameron. It's been a number of things before that. We're special agents of the FBI. We have a warrant here for the arrest of you and your wife. It can't prove anything. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to prove that you didn't commit suicide, and neither did that soldier in Paris. Peter Clayton, before being extradited, was turned over to local authorities who wanted him on a swindling charge. These authorities sentenced him to life imprisonment. His wife, Elizabeth, was given a five-year sentence in state court on charges of conspiracy. The suspicions entertained by the two special agents of your FBI that Peter Clayton had not actually committed suicide were investigated and found to be true. Special Agent Taylor learned from the policeman who had gotten the telephone call reporting the suicide that the call had come from Joe's Diner, an all-night lunchroom located near the bridge. When Taylor went to the diner and showed Peter Clayton's picture to the counterman, he identified Clayton as the man who had made the telephone call reporting the suicide. Armed with the knowledge that Clayton was still alive, Taylor then proceeded to the address supplied by the auto rental service, the address to which they had taken Mrs. Clayton. And thus, a murder committed some 3,500 miles away. A wanton murder that took place in Paris was solved through the cooperation of the Paris Surette, of the local police of North Centerville, and of your FBI. Cooperation that today makes the Federal Bureau of Investigation part of an international force which is fighting the criminals of the world every hour of every day. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last question on the Equitable Education Fund. Uh, Mr. Keating, how old should a child be when you start one of these plans for him? Any age, from one week old on up. Remember, the younger the child is when you start his Equitable Education Fund, the lower the yearly cost is to you, because you spread the total amount over more years. So the sooner you act, the better. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative right away. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case history of the operations of a group of female bandits. Its subject, robbery. Its title, Deadlier Than the Male. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Deadlier than the mail on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.